Another weekend in the books, another heat advisory for the Portland metro area. Census figures estimate that 78% of Portland metro residents have air conditioning, but that means 22% don't, and those people are still suffering. I'm Andrew Thien, and this is Beat Check with the Oregonian. Up next, breaking news reporter Austin De Dios, who covers public safety issues and diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Oregonian and Oregon Live. We talked about his recent reporting trip to a mobile home park, why people are still thinking about last year's deadly heat dome, which killed nearly 100 people across the state, how things have improved a bit this year in terms of government outreach, but why there's still so much work to be done. Here's our conversation. Austin De Dios, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Happy to be here. So Austin, we in the Portland area experienced another extended heat wave this year. By the time people are listening to this, it'll be another series of very hot days, but not on the same level of last summer in the deadly heat dome. You and a photographer recently took some trips out to various spots in the Portland area. Can you talk about where you went and kind of why and, and what you saw? Yeah. Um, so we went to two different locations that day. Um, we first went to a neighborhood in the Lentz, uh, community and, and, uh, went to a multifamily building there. Um, and our goal really going out to these places was to find communities that were going to be most affected by the heat with vulnerable populations. Um, so people who don't have access to AC, um, people who are in heat islands that are absorbing a lot of heat from, from buildings and roads, et cetera. Um, so we first went out to a multifamily building out in the Lentz neighborhood and, um, we didn't get anybody on the record. Um, but we were talking to just a few people, um, who, who were hanging out outside. Um, and I believe that day it was about the high was supposed to be 97 degrees. Um, when we went out there, just talking to a few people to see if they were doing okay. And that building, they seemed all right, but you know, people, people visibly looked exhausted, um, from the day before where temperatures were over 95, um, and, and they didn't cool off too much in the night. So you, you could kind of see, um, that people were, you know, they were tired. Um, and that was only, I want to say the third, second day of the heat wave at this point. Um, so that, that prolonged, um, heat over 95 was obviously going to have a big effect. Um, and so from there we did go to mobile stage with, which is, um, an elderly, uh, retirement community. Um, and of course they all live in mobile or manufactured homes and those homes, especially mobile homes, um, c- can really be, uh, they can get really hot, right? Cause they're aluminum boxes in a lot of cases. Right. Um, and with the heat bearing down on them, um, it's, it's kind of a dangerous space to be in. Um, and so, yeah, we went out there and a lot of people were just sitting outside. Luckily, um, at that point that we were out there that morning, it wasn't egregiously hot yet. Um, I want to say it was, it was about in the eighties, um, probably about 85 mm-hmm. by the time we actually arrived. Um, so people could still be outside in the shade. Um, but yeah, one of the houses, um, that we first saw that was just right in the front of the lot, um, was, uh, the, the Weber's home. Um, and Merlin Weber was, was sitting outside, um, and he was, uh, he has really bad psoriasis in his hands. And um, when you saw him out there peeling his hands with like a pair of pliers. Mm. Um, but also he had a, a broken fan at his feet. Um, he was trying to fix it. Uh, we approached him just asking if he was okay to talk with us. And at first, you know, he was a little hesitant, but I think everyone's just a little on edge with the heat and it seemed like he was in a, a good deal of pain. Right. Um, but he was happy to talk with us. Uh, and he, uh, yeah, he, he was trying to fix a fan. Um, but because of his condition and the fact they didn't have tools, um, he couldn't really get it put together which is uh, a shame. Um, but I, as we talked more, we realized uh, his, his, both his wife and his daughter um, were both very vulnerable to the heat. Um, his wife, uh, I believe her name was Judy. She, um, she had a heat stroke uh, in 1996 and, and has been really sensitive to the heat ever since. Mm. Um, and they don't have an air conditioning in their home. Um, so he was telling us that, you know, he's really worried about them, but also it's very difficult for him to drive. And so he, couldn't really take them to, to a cooling shelter. Um, and so it, it was just kind of a really difficult situation for him and the family. And, uh, luckily people in the neighborhood had, had donated fans to him. And so they had a few fans in there, but I want to say the night before they had told me it was about 90 degrees in there while they were trying to sleep, which I have experienced and that's pretty unbearable. Um, so, uh, it was just, 
yeah, it was, it was, it was difficult to see. Um, and it, all in all, they seemed in as good spirits as they could be, but, uh, I did see them uh, eventually hop in a car. I don't know if they went anywhere, yeah. um, but I think they might've taken some refuge with AC in, in the vehicle. Um, yeah. So the yeah. mobile estates obviously is just one of many manufactured home parks or mobile home parks around Oregon. Can you remind people, you know, last year during the deadly heat dome, you kind of alluded to the dangers of living in these facilities during a heat wave. How deadly was it last year for people living in mobile home parks? I can't remember exactly uh, the statistics, but uh, amongst the elderly community, um, it, it, people over 60, I want to say it was, it was close to 80% of the deaths were amongst people over 60. So people in these communities, um, and, and of course, people also living alone. And, and that was another um, aspect of, of these parks is that people were uh, living on their own in there. Um, but, you know, there was, there was a specific push by the county um, to reach out to these communities specifically. Um, I want to say about 10,000 messages were sent to uh, both owners of the parks and, and you know, the, the residents themselves. Um, and just, just as a reminder, Hey, you know, we have, we have the cooling shelters, um, take care of yourself, stay hydrated, like yeah. all these little reminders that we think, you know, should be obvious, but in times like this, when it's so hot, sometimes you're not thinking straight. Um, so it's important to, to get those out there. Well, I have the, uh, the story that you filed uh, along with the uh, photos from our, our colleague, Beth Nakamura up on my screen. And it was nearly one in five of the hundred people who died in yeah. Oregon, uh, during That's the heat right. dome lived in, in mobile parks. Um, but, um, mobile estates, uh, where is it? Uh, can you locate us in, in Portland? Where, where specifically is that? Yes. Um, it's in Southeast Portland. Um, as, as I recall. Okay. Yeah. Was that also an area that there's not a lot of, uh, shade? Yes. Um, so that park specifically, uh, at least had a lot of, a lot of trees out there, um, which helped, but the rest of the area surrounding it was buildings, roads, and, and not a lot of shade. Um, so the communities around there too, um, were, were at risk. Uh, and, and I'd say too, I, I believe they said they were going to cut down the trees in that area, which was going to be kind of problematic for the future for what little shade that they provided to kind of keep people out of that morning heat and give them a chance to cool off. So, yeah. Um, and, uh, according to your reporting, no one died, um, in the heat dome at, at the mobile estates park that you visited. So, um, no. but, uh, as you saw, it was still plenty hot when it was in the mid nineties. Yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier uh, the, the the desire to go out and and see some of these urban um, heat islands. Uh, r remind us what exactly that means, and like, what did you see when you're out in the Lens area? A heat island um, is is any kind of urban area that's that's mostly concrete and buildings, and, and as the sun beats down, all of those buildings and concrete will absorb the heat, making it a lot hotter than, than in other areas, say with, with a lot of parks, trees, wildlife, things like that. Um, and so these areas just get very, very hot, um, when the sun's at, at full force. Right. Um, and, and these communities tend to be, uh, lower income communities, mm -hmm. Um, and often filled with people, uh, people of color, um, elderly communities, and you know, again, lower income. Yeah. So for example, when it was 116 degrees in the heat dome of, uh, 2021 in, in the Portland area, very well was, may have been significantly hotter in, uh, lens yeah. at the, at the, uh, the apartment complex that you visited. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, yeah, some context to that, I believe, researcher went out uh, last year to actually test that um, and, and found that the hottest temperatures um, during that summer and during that heat wave were in the Lentz neighborhood, um, reaching uh, in some areas, at least on the concrete above, above that 116. You mentioned earlier kind of the, the efforts that the Multnomah County had done to try to assist people with cooling units. Can you give us any sort of update in terms of what they have done, um, what local governments have done to get people cooling units, because, you know, obviously this was a national and international story that so many people had died in the, both in Oregon and Washington and in British Columbia last year during the heat dome. I mean, yeah. how, how have we done in terms of helping people get some level of relief? I'd say that one of the first things that, that the county made a really big push on was reaching out to uh, the property owners of these multifamily buildings, apartment buildings, et cetera, uh, to make sure that one, they're aware that the heat is coming and, 
And two, make sure that they have proper resources and communication with residents to let them know locations of, of cooling shelters when the time came. Um, I believe the county reached out to 292 different multifamily buildings um, to try and get in contact with them and have a discussion about how they could come together to kind of battle this heat. Um, and so those messages continued during the heat wave. Uh, they sent hundreds of thousands of messages to both residents and property owners in in places like mobile estates and in multifamily buildings as well, just to let them know, um, you know, that he was coming and, and here are the resources that we have. And in terms of those resources, uh, they, they opened uh, several overnight cooling shelters. I believe it was four in total, housing upwards of 300 people. Um, and there were misting shelters and just other uh, local community buildings, libraries, etc., that seemed to be open. And, and I definitely felt this year compared to last year that there was a lot more communication about where these shelters were and how you can get to them. Uh, for example, TriMet uh, giving free rides. I, I didn't I didn't hear about that last year. Maybe it was happening, but I feel the communication that was a lot stronger this year uh, from the county. And also you could call the 211 hotline, uh, which I believe was set up last year for these events. Uh, and they would also be able to get you a free ride there. So I think that was an important component is some people couldn't get there. For example, the Webers, if they needed it, they had TriMet availability or the 211 hotline to get to a cooling shelter uh, if necessary. One of the things that struck me from your reporting visiting the the Webers was it's not a new thing, although the, you know there's been this really big push, obviously, in the wake of, you know, 100 people dying, nearly yeah. 100 people dying across Oregon. But Multnomah County had a weatherization program that actually installed uh, a heat pump, you know, a cooling unit uh, that that is an air conditioning um, type unit for the Webers back in 2012, a decade ago. Um, yeah. But what happened with that? What Merlin Weber told me, uh, they, they installed it in 2012. It later broke in 2016. Um, and he could apply to have it fixed and or replaced. Um, and uh, he said he had talked to the county um, and over the phone, but he needs to fill out. There's a specific application you need to fill out through weatherization services uh, once, you, once you've qualified mm -hmm. to have the heat pump installed in the first place and to have it repaired later. Um, and uh, I, I talked to the county about that and they said anyone who, who needs that service um, and finds the application difficult can can call and and be walked through the application process. Uh, but that application was a big barrier for him. And, and I think that's something we see common to government services is sometimes people in these communities find the application process uh, difficult, complicated or not worth their time. Um, and so we get these situations where people don't end up doing it. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come and talk a little bit more with Austin De Dios. He's a public safety reporter for the Oregonian and Oregon Live and is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, Austin. So I kind of mentioned there before the break that you're covering equity, diversity, inclusion for us. How, how did this story fit into that broader beat um, in terms of how you approached it and then why editors thought it was an important story to tell? Absolutely. Um, I'd say... You know, and, and I kind of mentioned this before, um, a lot of communities affected by the heat are lower income communities. Um, and, and often that's disproportionately people of color. And in this case, also elderly people who are, are more vulnerable to the heat, but also, you know, in that uh, financial predicament as well. Um, and so it, the point of going out here was, was it, in one way, uh, just, just to check on the community, even if there wasn't a story here just making sure that people are okay and staying cool. We got a lot of um, thank yous from residents just saying thank you for, for coming out here and checking on us um, and, and really appreciative of, of that as a service because um, I guess people just felt like it's important to, to check on one another. Um, and so that kind of said a lot about that community too, to me. Um, but you know, that, that angle of let's, Let's make sure people without AC who can't afford air conditioning units, um, who are in these heat islands, which are often, you know, lower rent, um, lower prices out there. Let's make sure that they, they are staying cool, staying safe and staying healthy. Uh, and, and of course that is where the, the diversity and inclusion angle is. Let's make sure all these people's voices are heard. Um, and, and it's not just people with air conditioning complaining about going outside, right? Um, exactly. And these are definitely people on the front lines who, who are in the most danger. Um, and so telling your story and, and putting it out there also allows um, 
people to to visibly see. I got a lot of requests from people with leftover air conditioners um, to my email inbox saying, hey, I, I have this air conditioning. Is there a place I can donate it to? Where can I send this to help people? Um, so, you know, getting these stories out for these people who are more vulnerable uh, can, can often bring the community to help them as well. I'm curious, what other stories are you kind of interested in pursuing on this? Because as I mentioned, you know, we're talking on a Friday, but there's expected to be triple digit temperatures again on Sunday. And it seems, you know, we're not even halfway through summer yet. So this isn't, you know, the heat dome happened at the end of June. It was so anomalous in so many ways, but you know, we still have a long ways to go here. What what are you interested in learning or reporting about? One of the things that I've uh, seen talked about on multiple occasions while I was at mobile estates um, and just outside of mobile estates and, and, and being in downtown, um, they, the county is supposed to be um, working with nonprofit uh, providers to get free air conditioning units uh, to people in the city as part of uh, a movement that they started last year with the heat dome and everything. Um, and I, I'm not so sure how that disbursement is going. I know there are supply chain issues and probably an overabundance of people requesting the free air conditioning units. Um, but I'd be curious to see, you know, who, who's requesting these units? Where are they going to? How well are they being shipped out? I want to say the county's ordered about 3,000 air conditioning units. I can't say how many exactly they've actually been able to ship out, but I had heard from people from mobile estates that it's it's a slow process. Um, so I'd be curious to see where that's going and, and if those air conditioning units are getting to those more vulnerable communities um, in the way that they should be. Um, and also, you know, just, just a, a wider view of weatherization services because, I mean, they've been around since 1984, um, but they're their job now seems a lot more difficult and a lot more um, important with with recurring heat waves that seem to be coming as, as climate change kind of changes the game for us in, in adjusting to these hot summers. Um, so just seeing how they approach um, helping these vulnerable communities and, and what resources they might have to offer um, as, as time goes on. Your headline on your piece, I think, kind of from, from the uh, mobile estates kind of spoke to, I think, what a lot of people felt just that this sparked absolutely miserable memories, right? I mean, was that kind of, can you just elaborate a little bit on, on that? Like in terms of your discussions out there? Absolutely. Um, yeah, residents, I mean, it, that heat wave is still fresh on their mind. Um, and, and back then they, they were a lot less prepared than they were now because luckily a lot of people I talked to had installed bedroom air conditioners, standing air conditioners, so they can at least, you know, have relief and sleep at night. Um, and, and when that first heat wave came and that heat dome, people weren't as prepared. Um, and so you could see, uh, faces change when, when you mentioned it. Um, and you could tell people were really going back to that time and just being so hot and miserable um, and not having as clear communication as where cooling shelters are and not as clear communication on how to, to get the free rides and everything. It made it a lot more difficult to be able to combat the heat. So not only was it hotter during that time, um, but you also had less resources to, to get yourself away and, and take a break from that. Um, so it was definitely, it was very visible. Um, and, and luckily it seemed people, again, were more prepared this time around um, overall than, than they were before. That being said, you know, um, I, I grew up in Oregon from the time I was five, right. And, and in yeah. Southern Oregon where it's super hot. And now here we are two years in a row where we're writing about hyperthermia, which is just not something I was prepared to see covered on a regular basis, but that might be our reality going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's something that kind of stuck with me uh, from from a press conference recently that the county held uh, as temperatures were about to reach their their peak um, and, and become the most dangerous phase uh, into the over 100 range. Uh, uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler had said that it it's it's only it's only July. We still have all of August to get through, um, and and we're seeing September stay in those higher temperatures as well. So it, it's very uh, almost unpredictable how long the summer might last and and when we might have another heat wave again. Um, and so that's one component I think people need to be prepared for is, you know, this is this is a new reality that we have to live with is that the summers are hotter and the summers are longer. Is there anything else uh, from your reporting on this issue that I should have asked you that you'd want to hit on? I think that was pretty comprehensive. Yeah, I think that covered everything.
you know, obviously this is a tough topic, but we're excited to have you on staff at the Oregonian and people see your byline and uh, obviously people are already finding you and, and reaching out to you. Um, so keep up the good work and thanks for Thank you. taking time to talk. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Beat Check with the Oregonian. I shared links to some of Austin's work and our coverage of last year's Heat Dome in the episode notes. If you like this show, give us a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. And tell a friend. Help spread the word. The best way to support our journalism is through a subscription to Oregon Live. You can do that at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Until next time.